good to see you all out this morning. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your uh, goodness, your love, your compassion, your mercies that are new every morning. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together to the house of God to uh, fellowship one with another, to uh, hear the word of God, to sing together, to worship uh, one with another. And uh, we pray, Lord, this morning that your name would be lifted up and uh, that your word would be preached. Speak to our hearts, Lord, through the word of God and to help us to be uh, better Christians because we are here today and to help us to go and preach the gospel uh, in our community and reach lost souls for Christ. Well, thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus proved his love for you and me. He bore my pain and died in shame alone on Calvary. Love is flowing, love still flows. From the heart of Jesus, love still flows. sin and disappoint my loving Lord, and my broken heart cries out to God in prayer. Though I know I'm so unworthy of my Savior's love, my Jesus brings me cleansing and I find forgiveness.
Amen. Let's all stand again. Page 884. 884. Whosoever meaneth me. morning. Got a few announcements to go through real quick this morning. Prayer meeting tonight at 515. We'd love for you to be here if you can and uh, pray with us. Uh, we have a ladies prayer meeting and a men's prayer meeting and uh, down in the hallway here and so we'd love for you to be a part of that. If you're able to make it, Senior Saints prayer meeting Tuesday at 10 a.m. and again we'd love to have you for that. You know prayer, uh, prayer is what moves God to move people. Amen. And so it's prayer. Prayer is important. Um, it, it helps. It helps bring the church together. And uh, the work of God goes forward when we pray. So let's pray together. Uh, Wednesday night, we have our prayer time as well. Come for that. Uh, we're also finishing our Bible study on the Holy Spirit. So this will be the last of the series on the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're going to be talking about sins against the Holy Spirit. And so if you've ever heard about the unpardonable sin, and you're not sure about it or what it is, that's one of the things we'll be talking about on Wednesday night. And so that's all I'll say about it. So come Wednesday night, and there's also a WANA for children. And so if you've got children, 
um, you know, that uh, uh, don't have a, a program that they're a part of, we'd love to have them here for the Awana program on Wednesday night. And that all starts at 7, so uh, mark your calendars for that. Uh, our weekly visitation will be on Thursday, and um, I appreciate there's been many who have come and uh, been a part, and some of you are going from your houses and asking for cards, and we appreciate um, you know, every person that's been involved in our visitation soul winning program, and uh, it's, um, it, it helps, right? Uh, the Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We had our missions conference last week. We left the flags up this week because I wanted to, uh, you know, we're going to collect our faith promise cards uh, here in a little bit again. But um, I wanted to leave those up to, you know, continue the vision for our missions. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it's not just giving to the missionary. It's going while we're here. Amen. We're going to preach about that a little bit this morning. Uh, our track challenge. Team Caldwell. So far, this is of last week, so we don't have numbers yet for this week till tonight, hopefully. So tonight, hopefully, we'll have our, our numbers. But Team Caldwell, 468. Team Norman, 568. And the best for last, of course, Team Turner, 318. And total, with all three teams, 1,354 tracks that have been given out. So that's a blessing. I mean, that's worse. We still got one... One week left of numbers to collect, and uh, so we'll, we'll see, but we're, that's pretty close. That's going to be pretty close to our, our goal of 2,000, and so I appreciate everybody who has been a part of that um, and passing out tracts, and it's just, it's part, again, part of giving out the gospel, amen? It's a way we can give the gospel. I know pastors who are pastoring churches today because somebody handed them a gospel tract. They may not have had time to listen, may not have had time to, um, you know, you know, just in passing, may not have had time, time to present the whole gospel, but that track, they read that and they got saved. So uh, they do work. Amen. Um, anyone graduating this year, uh, whether from college or from high school, make sure you connect with Miss Teresa um, this week if possible, please. So we have, make sure we get everybody included. And so please make sure to do that either today or this week sometime. Uh, so that we um, can make our plans for our June 12th graduate reception. And then, of course, mark your, uh, mark your calendars for that. We want you to be here uh, when we honor you. Amen? And today is the last day to sign up for um, and get your payment in for the Ladies' Day. Uh, so please uh, see Teresa. She will be in the back lobby after church is over. And um, if you haven't signed up, you can uh, catch her in the lobby right immediately after church. Um, church elections will be held May 18th, and we'll be saying more about that shortly. The names of those that uh, will be nominated uh, will be announced on Wednesday uh, after our board meeting on Tuesday. And so keep the May 18th will be the elections for that. Uh, men's cookout is scheduled for Saturday, June 18th, and we're excited about that, and that's gonna be at, held at Irvin Park this year. And we've got some uh, good things uh, in the works for that. Uh, if you have a cornhole game, I mentioned this last week, and of course told y'all I had the big M, uh, you know, cornhole game. So I think somebody's got a, a Penn State one. And anyway, so if you've got a cornhole game, uh, you know, see me so that we can coordinate and make sure we have enough uh, for what we want to do that day. And there'll be some other activities as well. But looking forward to a good time uh, Saturday, June 18th. Uh, and then we will be having a meeting on Tuesday the 10th, so that's a week from this coming Tuesday for all sportsmen or sportswomen. So if you wanna be involved, um, our goal is to get as many people involved so that we can you know, um, get this planned and get it done. The dates will be March 11th for next year um, that we will be ho hosting a sportsman's banquet. I'm excited about our speaker for the year, uh, for next year. He is a, a pastor, um, but he's a sportsman, and he's been to pretty much just about every continent um, hunting and preaching, and he, he's, um, he's got some stories, and so I look forward to that, and uh, then I want to say a big thank you to everyone again for our family. Um, it seems in moving in, um, God has just been very good, and y'all have been very good. Um, it just seems like there's there's things that we've needed and we haven't even had to say it 
um, or in just in, in talking, someone gave us a brand new washer because our washer went on the clink and uh, we've been given loads of wood, we've been given loads of gravel, we've been, I mean, just, and people helping, and it's just been tremendous. People, uh, someone or a couple someones gave money toward our moving expenses, and um, it's just been one thing after another. And uh, so we just, I just want to say, again, a extremely uh, grateful um, family uh, that we are toward, toward you all. Um, and some of you, I don't even know what you gave because um, it was given anonymously. And so we, we can't thank you necessarily in a card, although we try to do that, but we're going to thank you publicly. Um, you, you guys have been very, very good to us. And uh, so we appreciate that very much. Um, it's, it's been a lot. And we're very overwhelmed by your generosity. And that all with us giving to, you know, the re, in the Revival and to Missions Conference and to the Hamiltons, and it's just been so many generous offerings, and yet you still have been generous with us as well. And so again, I just want to personally say thank you to everyone who has been a part of helping us, and um, we, we appreciate it very much. Uh, the last announcement is our Faith Promise cards. In the front of you, uh, there is a, a card, and it just says, My Faith Promise, and it says, I pledge to give, and it gives an amount per month toward faith promise. It gives a little check, check box for child, teen, or, or adult. There's no place for a name. We ask you not to put your name on it. This is just a commitment between you and God. And the only reason we ask for you to do it is so that we know, as a church, what we can plan for for our giving to the missionaries for this next year. Um, without, without this, we're flying blind. And so we just we ask you to fill it out. And the other thing this does is it solidifies your commitment in your mind. It's not just, well, okay, I can give X amount of dollars. It's, I can give X amount of dollars. Lord, I'm pledging this to you. And so it gives a, a solidification, so to speak, in your own mind, in your heart, that yes, I can give this, and this is what God has laid upon my heart to give. And so we hope that you participate. If you haven't yet, uh, you can take it out of the you know, front pew in front of you, put it in the offering plate. Uh, if you don't quite get it into the offering plate, There'll be offering plates on the back table, and you can get it in the uh, back offering plate as you exit the service today. And so we appreciate that. We're looking forward to what God will do uh, this year in our faith promise uh, commitments and being able to give to uh, the missionaries. All right, gentlemen, if you'll come, we'll go ahead and receive the offering.
right, let's do one more hymn this morning. Take your hymn books, go to hymn number 378. Now I belong to Jesus. I trust you can say that this morning. And let's go ahead and stand as we say. Good singing. Please remain standing for our scripture reading time. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to begin reading uh, here in verse 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty be abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also, and then I want us to notice verse 8. The Bible says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your blessings, your love to us. And we pray that you would bless the message this morning. Help us, Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture and think about our faith promise commitments that we have made or will make. And Lord, help us uh, to uh, be strong in our, in our giving to the world missions, to the cause of Christ, to the preaching of the gospel. And we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
it seems that nobody cares it still matters what you do because there's a difference you can make but the choice is up to you will you be the one to answer to his call and will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world be the one. Oh, sometimes it is hard to know who is right and what is wrong and where are you supposed to stand when the battle lines are drawn there's a voice that keeps calling out for someone who's not afraid to be a beacon in the night to a world that's lost its way. Will you be the one to answer to his call? And will you stand when those around you fall? Will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world? Tell me, will you be the one? There are some battles we must fight from day to day. Yet the Lord provides the power for us to stand and say, Yes, I'll be the one to answer to his call. I will stand when those around me fall. I will be the one to take his light into a darkened world. Amen. Junior Church can be dismissed. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse 8, the Bible says, and to prove the sincerity of your love. You know, few things prove that you love Christ. Few, few things prove that we love God, that we love him supremely, that God is first place in our life, that God is supreme in our lives, that God is sitting on the throne of our lives, so to speak. But there is one thing that will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that we love him, that we love him supremely, that he is our first love, that he is the one that's first place in our life. And that is our obedience. We can say that we love him, but only our obedience, only our actions prove it. Or they prove that we don't. Our obedience shows without a doubt that we love him. Our obedience shows anyone watching whether our love for Christ is real. You know, often we look at Christianity and, and we look at the Bible, or people do, and they say, well, it's just a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's just a bunch of things that, you know, we, we should do or shouldn't do, and, it, and it's just not for me. You know, everywhere we look in life is full of do's and don'ts. We live in a country of laws. 
We live in cities with laws. We go to school with laws. We go to work with laws. Everywhere we go, there's do's and don'ts. So let's put that aside for a moment because it's really an invalid point. Our obedience is what shows us and shows the world around us that we love God. You can say that you love your wife, gentlemen. But if you don't ever do anything for her, there's going to come a time when she doesn't believe you anymore. Right? If we don't, what? Prove our love. If we are not proving our love, if we're not doing something for our our wife, she's not going to think we love her anymore. And you can reverse that with the wife to the husband, etc. What am I saying? Our love, people see, uh, the world around us sees that we love God. Why? By our actions. By what we do. By our obedience to Christ. Men, I'm not saying you should obey your wives. I'm just using it as an example. Okay, that wasn't that funny, I guess. Okay. Uh, And in 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Our words are fine, but our actions are what prove. Our words are good. We can say, honey, I love you, but our action of I'm going to do something for you proves that we love her. We can say all day long, I love you, Lord. But it's just sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. It's just words. It's just air. Unless we can back up our pro- and prove with our actions, with our obedience to Christ. The Bible says in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. So here again, we can be a great orator. A person could understand prophecy and be able to, and, and this was back in the apostles' day, we don't have the sign gifts today, but a person could tell the future and could be able to do all this stuff and have great faith so that we could remove mountains. And he says, and if we have, have not charity, we're nothing. And then in verse 3, he says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, He's talking about an incredible sacrifice to give everything. Remember the rich young ruler in the Bible? And he came to Jesus, and what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know, you got to keep all the commandments. you got to do all this. And he says, I've done all that. And he says, well, okay, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Come follow me. And he's like, he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had great riches. He wasn't willing to do this, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. At the end of the day, if we sacrifice yet not in obedience, it profiteth, profiteth nothing. And so our love for Christ is shown by our obedience. We can't say that we love him and do not keep his commandments. If we love him, we will prove that by our obedience. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And then John said in 1 John 2, verse 3, And hereby we know uh, we, we do know that we know him if we, what, keep his commandments. Verse 4, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. He, let me read that again. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, what is that, obedience? In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. So we can say, I love you, Lord, 
But let me ask you a question this morning. Do your actions prove your love for God? Do your actions prove to people around you that you do love God? Now, I'm going to say some things this morning, and I'm not trying to offend people, and so don't, this is just the Bible. I'm just going to preach the Bible this morning, okay? The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together is the manner of some, is, and such the more as you see the day approaching, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. What is that? That means we're to be in church. Uh, growing up, my dad was a Baptist preacher, and so I get it. My experience probably is a lot different than some of you that didn't grow up in church, right? Uh, so there's probably a lot of people in this room this morning that didn't grow up in church, didn't grow up going to church faithfully. Maybe church is new for you. Maybe church is a brand new thing for you. Maybe it's fairly new, but you haven't quite you know, figured it all out. I, I don't know. But that's not our church's commandment. That's not our church's, that's God saying that. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And, and people then would say, well, pastor, that's just one verse. There's only one verse in the Bible that says that we're to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. There's only one place in the whole Bible that says that we are to go to church. Well, in a roundabout way, in a straight-up command, yes. In a roundabout way, there, the whole principle of the Word of God is that. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, there are, it talks about how that the church, that Jesus died for the church and gave his life for the church. And then it talks about the body of Christ and that what? We are to be members together in the body of Christ. What's the body of Christ? It is, a, it is the local, visible assembly. That is the church. And th there's a whole long, that I'm not going to get into, a whole long um, lesson that we can talk about, local church versus universal church. The universal church cannot assemble, so you cannot call the un uh, universal conglomerate a church. So we'll just throw that out right now. The word church comes from the word Greek word ekklesia, which is a called out assembly. So the word church itself is an assembly of people. So you can, there's no such thing as a universal church, okay? So when the Bible talks about the broader everybody who's saved, it talks about the bride of Christ. So that's a whole study that we'll do someday, all right? But just understand that when the Bible says, my, my wife's laughing, I say, I, I, evidently I've said that a few times. We're going to do a study on that. We're going to, you know, anyway. And uh, so she's down here laughing because she hears me say that again. We're going to do a study on that one day. Amen. Uh, one day we will. Hopefully I have a lot of years to cover all the stuff that I want to cover. <laughs> wow. And uh, so the Bible is full. The New Testament is full of, of teaching of the New Testament and gathering together. You know the early Christians in the book of Acts, you will find them gathering together on a daily basis. Now, I understand that not everybody came to every house. There was thousands of new Christians at that time, and they were gathered together. They literally had church, like, every day, all over the place. I just mentioned I, I was born, my dad was a Baptist preacher, and so nine months before I was born, I was in church every Sunday. We were taught that you go to church... Every time the doors were open. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. Probably not many people know this. Maybe one or two in this room would actually know this. My dad was not, uh, he didn't believe in Christmas. He didn't celebrate Christmas. He believed in the birth of Christ. Don't misunderstand me. We didn't celebrate Christmas growing up. Um, we didn't do gift exchange and all that kind of stuff. We didn't set up a tree. But we went to a church to set up trees at Christmas. We had Christmas parties at school, at the Christian school. We had uh, all kinds of, we had a Christmas cantata, we had a school Christmas play, we had all kinds of Christmas, Christmas things. We had uh, Christmas um, caroling at our church. And you know what my dad's philosophy was? 
We're personally not going to celebrate Christmas. Now, I do. My wife and I do. Our kids do. Um, that's something my dad chose. Uh, we've chosen a different path in that regard. But my dad said, we're not going to celebrate Christmas because of the origins of Christmas, etc. And you can look at that, whatever. It doesn't, I, don't, I don't think it matters today in today's culture. Here's what I'm saying. We didn't celebrate Christmas, but at every one of those church functions, even though they were Christmas, we were there. You know why? Because my dad's philosophy was when the church doors are open, we're there. Now, I know I'm, I'm saying a lot, and I'm, I'm really putting myself out on a limb this morning by, by doing this. But here's what I'm saying. Church attendance is obedience to God. It's not a man-made, you know, people talk about, oh, well, church is man-made. No, it's not. Look, all, if, if you, and people say, oh, I stay home and study the Bible. Do you? Because if you do, then you'll come all throughout the New Testament. You'll find over and over and over and over and over and over again, the church, the church, the church, the church, which is a called out assembly. It's a group of people gathering together to worship together to what? Edify one another. You can't edify me and I can't edify you if you stay at home. Someone came to me the other day and said, Pastor, I don't like the live stream because it takes people out of church. It allows them to stay at home and gives them the option to stay at home. And I said, you know, the truth is I'm with you on that. I, I don't like the live stream because of that. But I like the live stream in the fact that it gives people who can't come to church an option to hear it. Right? But the truth is if you use live stream as an option to not come to church, you're, you're using a crutch. The church gathers together. The church is right here. It's us. It's not this building. It's, I mean, the early Christians, in, in many cases over the first few centuries, they gathered together in caves. They gathered together in the forest. And they gathered together in people's homes. They did whatever they could because they couldn't build a church building, put a sign up, and say, this is our church. It would have been destroyed in the early days. They would have, the preachers and the, the people would have been uh, thrown in prison. So they had to gather in secret, but they did it just the same. What about Bible reading? I mean, we could go through the Bible today and show verse after verse after verse after verse of Scripture that says that we're to read our Bible, that we're to put, hide its words in our heart, that we're to read and memorize and study and know the Scripture I say all that, and there's so many more things that we could come out with obedience and talk about biblical obedience of our church. But here in this passage, we find a very specific obedience, a very specific obedience that is shown to prove the sincerity of our love, and that's what he says. So he talks in the first seven verses about the grace of giving or grace giving, of giving this church that gave beyond their power, this church in Macedonia that gave out of their deep poverty. I highly doubt there's anybody here this morning or in our culture in America that has deep poverty. Even those who say that they're poor or uh, would fit the bill of being in what we would call today poverty still have a smartphone that probably would retail for $1,000. Right? Right? So none of us in this world are in deep poverty. But here in this passage, they didn't give out of their abundance that they had. They gave out of their deep poverty. They didn't give a, a token because they had so much to give and they could give generously in man's eyes because they had a generous amount to give. They gave out of their deep poverty. This obedience is not just the typical go to church, read your Bible truths, but it's an obedience that requires a sacrifice to complete. It's a sacrificial giving. However, God does not want our sacrifice in replacement of our obedience, but he wants our sacrifice in our obedience. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. That means that God does not want us to give instead of going, but while we are giving, we are also going. We don't give to the mission field so that we, don't so that we can sit at home and do nothing. We give 
to the mission field so that someone can go where we can't go. But in the same time, we're supposed to be going here. We are supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, I love it that many of you have picked up those gospel tracts. We've passed out probably um, in the last month, we've passed out probably close to 2,000 tracts. That's awesome that you're going and that you're giving it. Even though you may not be able to reach that person personally, you're giving that out to them. You're, you're giving the gospel to someone. But I already know we printed 5,000 tracts. So I know, and people were giving them out before. We have three boxes. I'm half, we're halfway done with the third box. That means either somebody's hoarding them at home <laughs> or somebody's giving them out. And that's a, that does my heart good because we're, we're, we're obeying the command of the Lord to give out the gospel. You may not be able to go door to door right now. Some of you have physical ailments, uh, and I understand that. Uh, you may not be able to do the visiting that you would like to do or the visiting maybe that some of us as a church can do, um, but maybe you can pray for us as we go. You can hand out a tract as, as you go through your daily life to your doctors and your nurses and, and the people you come in contact with and, and at Walmart grocery pickup. I've been to Walmart grocery pickup three times. Every time I've been to Walmart grocery pickup, there's people that come after, I, they pull up after I pull up. I'm sitting there waiting for my groceries, and there's people that pull up after me and get their groceries first. I'm like, we checked in. They know I'm here. Anyway, so I'm like, I told Stephanie, I'm not going to Walmart grocery pickup anymore. I, I might as well spend the time go in and get it myself. Anyway, but while we're sacrificing, we should also be obeying. Uh, Abel sacrificed in obedience. He took that lamb. God said, I want a lamb of the first year without spot, without blemish. Abel took that sacrifice, the sacrifice that God wanted. And in obedience, Abel took that sacrifice and he sacrificed. But Cain, he just sacrificed. In his mind, I surmise that he surmised that what does it matter what I bring? God wants a sacrifice, right? So what does it matter what the sacrifice is? I don't have a lamb. I, I'm not a shepherd. I can't, I, I, don't, I don't have a lamb to give to God. So instead of giving what God wants, I'll just give God what I have in the fruit that I, that I have, have, with the sweat of my brow, with the work that I've done. Give God, I'll give God this. And he made a substitute. And that substitute was his fruits and vegetables. And somehow he expected that God would be okay with that. And God said, no, 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 Cain. I want a sacrifice, but I want a specific sacrifice because that sacrifice is the picture of my son that will die on the cross for you. And so while Cain gave a sacrifice, he gave it out of obedience. It's not that God didn't want the sacrifice. It's that God wanted his obedience. Let me give you four things this morning, and we'll run through this quick and we'll be done. First of all, the obedience of grace giving, they were willing. Look at this here in verse 3. The Bible says, and to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, beyond their power, they were what? Willing of themselves. They were willing of themselves. They said, God, I don't have much in fact, I have very little. In fact, we need what we have. Have you ever been there before where you say, God, I've, I've got so much money, but I need more than what I have. That's where they were out of their deep poverty. They probably needed more than what they had in their hand. More than what they owned. But what happened? They said, God, we need more, but we're going to give it to you because you're able to bless and give back. Out of their deep poverty they gave. They were willing. Are we willing this morning? Are we willing to give? True obedience starts with first a willing heart. We may obey for a time out of a sense of duty, but that will only last till our sense of duty is gone. 
And people are leaving churches today in droves because their sense of duty is now gone because they never had a willing heart. You see, having a willing heart lasts a lifetime. My parents taught us early on. There's six of us children. Five of us are still in church and one is not. And I'll tell you the honest truth. It's because she wasn't willing. She didn't want it. But as a child, I got saved. And as a child, I felt God's tug in my heart to go and preach the word of God. And at a young age, I said, I want to be that man. I want to be the one to preach the gospel. I want to be the one to preach the word of God. I want to be the one to turn a a city upside down. I want to be the one to do the work of God. At an early age, I was willing. And my sister, my little sister wasn't. She just wasn't willing. She didn't want it. And that's the difference in people who stay in church or people who fall out of church is that they lost their willingness or maybe they were never willing to begin with. You know, the widow's might. Jesus came to the, uh, to the temple one day with his disciples and they were watching all of these rich people come or well-to-do people and pour in their coffers. And boy, the disciples were amazed at, at this person and that person and how much they gave. And they missed the little widow lady who came and cast in her two mites. Just, just, just like two pennies. It was insignificant. And they totally missed it. But Jesus said, she's cast in more than they all. What, what, what do you mean? She only, had two, she only put in two mites. She only put in a tiny little bit. How is that more than they all? Jesus said, because they gave out of their abundance. They gave because they have tons, and they gave a small portion of what they had. But she gave in everything she had. She gave everything to God. So yeah, she gave more than they did. How convicting. You, you know, we may never give everything that we have, but we can always give more. Our faith increases when we are willing to do what God is asking of us. First, Second Corinthians 10, verse 12, where we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you in preaching the gospel of Christ. So this is the church at Corinth. So he's, Paul has come as far as Corinth in preaching the gospel. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors. So he's like, we're not talking about what everybody else has, has, has done, but what we have done. We've come as far as you to preach the gospel, but having hope that when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you. So he's talking about them giving and them being able to help Paul enlarge their coast and enlarge what they're doing. And he says in verse 16, to preach the gospel in regions beyond you, that we can go beyond you, that, we, that we've already stopped preaching the gospel as far as you but we want to go beyond that we want to go further in preaching the gospel and what is it going to take it's going to take your ability to help us get to that place and when a missionary comes to our missions conference or to our church basically in essence they're saying hey you can only go so far you've gone to where you are in preaching the gospel and the missionary's job is to go where we can't go to go to the regions beyond to go further to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and it takes our willingness so number one they were willing number two they gave beyond their power true giving starts when we give beyond what we feel comfortable with We can give tokens to Christ to make us feel good, and some Christians will do that. They'll put in a few dollars in the offering plate, and and they'll they'll feel good about themselves for a moment, but the true Bible giving comes with sacrifice. Philippians 4, 17, Paul said, not because I desire a gift. It wasn't that he wanted the money. It was, he said, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. When missionaries come to our church and other churches, it's not, yes, they're asking for money. They're asking for us to support them, to send them somewhere. But they're asking to, for us to partner with them, not so much that they would have money to go, but that we would be able to invest in eternity. 
And we have to change our mentality sometimes because our mentality is, is that we just, we, we're, we're giving to the missionary so that they can go. No, we're investing in eternity. We're investing in fruit that will abound to our account and every dollar that we spend, every $10, every $100, every $1,000 that we spend supporting missionaries is that much fruit that abounds to your account, to the church account, to us who are giving and, and, and pledging and, and, and giving what we can. But it's beyond our power. It doesn't just stop where we feel comfortable with. True giving starts when we give beyond what we feel comfortable with. Grace giving stretches our hearts, our minds, and our faith. They gave beyond their ability to give. They gave probably everything they had. They gave out of their deep poverty. They, they reached into their pockets knowing that they would need every dime that they had in their pocket, and yet they gave it anyway. They gave to the point that they had to trust God for their needs. You know, my dad used to always say in preaching, there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. And hopefully we'll never cross that line. Because if you give everything away that you have, at some point you're going to become a charity case and somebody's going to have to take care of you. So there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. And, and I understand that. There were times, my mom one time, we were, uh, we were in a meeting and they were taking up an offering and I reached out my hand to my mom to give me money so I could give it. My dad was in the Philippines at the time, and my mom looked in her purse. She had $5. That's all she had to our name until my dad returned about a week later. She's thinking, I need groceries. She's thinking, I, uh, you know, I mean, we've got bills to pay. I need more than this $5. And it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, yeah, you do. You need more than that, so just give it. So she pulled it out of her purse, handed it to me. I gave it in the offering plate. The next, no, that night, the offering was taken up for a missionary family. The missionary family came to the pastor of the church, and this was at a special meeting. It wasn't a missions conference. The, the missionary family came to the pastor and said, I want you to give this to the Blue family. And it was well over $300. And my mom thought, you know, I gave $5 thinking I need more than this. And God gave in great amount back. Now, it's not going to always happen that way. But God will take care of us when we give beyond our power. Luke 6, 38 says, Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure ye meet, it shall be met, it shall be uh, that ye meet with all. It shall be measured to you again. I brought with me today, a measure. It's two cups. So one of my favorite things in, in one of my favorite foods to, to make is I grill chicken. And so we take this two cup measure and we put two cups of vinegar in it. We add some other things, accent, salt, pepper, uh, butter, whatever, and we mix it all together and we baste it on chicken on the grill. Wow. You're talking about heavenly. It's got this nice tang to it, crispy, crispy uh, uh, skin on the outside, you know. Oh, man. Whew. I love port pit chicken. That's what we call it. I don't know where we got this recipe, but it's, it's man, it's good. Worcestershire sauce, about two, ta two tablespoons of Worcestershire. So I've got a two-cup measuring thing here. Now, how many of you would love to have God's blessing that much? You'd love to have that much of God's blessing in your life. Oh, okay. I mean, don't you want more? I mean, <laughs> I look at this and I'm like, eh, eh. No. I, I, want, I, want a, I want a bigger portion of God's blessing in my life. Amen? How about this one here? <laughs> I mean, yesterday bunch of men got together and we cleaned out uh, alongside the the uh, the drive in the parking lot out here and we we hauled about 20 of these buckets loaded with gravel and we hauled them up out here put them in the back of a pickup truck and the guys took them up here and that that's pretty heavy i mean you carry a load 
filled with gravel, you know, those, those are pretty heavy. Uh, and that's pretty good. How many of you would love to have God's blessing in, in this measure? That's it's definitely better, isn't it? I mean, I, that's not saying, you know, nothing to sneeze at. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I would like God's blessing in a bigger measure, wouldn't you? Now, let's see. Uh, oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the biggest I could put under the, you know, height under here. You know, I thought about getting Brother Jerry to bring his, uh, you know, his uh, tractor with his loader on it, and I thought maybe that would be a big, but we couldn't fit that in here. Okay, so what's the biggest measure that you would like to see God's blessing? I'm not promoting a health, wealth, and prosperity message this morning. I'm not. But the Bible says this, and I found it to be true, that with the same measure you meet, it will be met back to you. Now, I've had pastors take buckets, and I've seen pastors and people at missions conferences, st- you know, put it loose money there, say, okay, you give to God that, and they'll push it down, and he'll give back to you. God does not always give back to us in a monetary form. But the Bible says this, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. We want to invest this and reap this. We want to say, God, here's a, here, here's a little bit of my time. Here's a little bit, uh, here, you know, here's a few gospel tracts that I can pass out. Here's a few dollars that I can give. And, and I'm going to invest, I'm gonna, God, I'm going to invest this. And then when we turn around and we don't get the greater investment back. God, why aren't you blessing me more? And again, I'm not a health, wealth, prosperity. The command was given or the, uh, the promise was given to the children of Israel that if you eat the fat of the land uh, or if you be faithful and obedient, you shall eat the fat of the land. I'm not in any way saying that if you're poor, that, you don't have, that you're not blessed of God. In fact, probably some that are poor are blessed of God more because you have time with your family and you have so much more than, than uh, what some rich people have. Because riches corrupt. So God's not going to say, okay, you give this amount and I'll heap it up and, and I'll, I'll give you uh, in money that much more back. But when we give, God gives back in greater proportion, even using the same measure. And then number three, they gave themselves. The greatest key to sacrificial giving is first giving yourself. You always struggle to give what God wants you to give until you give yourself. Why? Because when we give ourselves, it will not hurt us to give what we have, because it's his already. When we reach in our pocket and we pull out our billfold or reach in your purse and you look in there and you say, okay, Lord, I've got, you know, I got a 20, I got a 10, I got a few ones in there, I got a five, you know, okay, I got, I got a little money here, Lord, but eh, I'm not, I just don't want to part with it. But if we say, God, I'm yours, take me, use me, whatever you want. I'm yours. I'm going to give you my, myself. Last Sunday night, uh, the, the missionary talked about the story of the little girl who placed herself in the offering basket. She didn't have any money to give, but she says, I'm going to place myself in the offering basket. And she gave herself. When God has you, this is insignificant. When God has you, you don't care about this anymore. They gave themselves, Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So wait a minute. My sacrifice as a living person, my living sacrifice, me giving myself to God is is my reasonable service. Yeah. Yeah. It's reasonable for me to say, God, I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you me. 
I'm going to give you myself as a living sacrifice to do exactly what you want to do with. And then number four, quickly, they gave what they had. You know, God's never going to ask anybody to give what you don't have. Never done it. I've even heard pastors talk and preachers get up and preach about how that, you know, you're to, that in, in missions giving, we, we give what we don't have. And I've never understood that because the, there's nowhere in the Bible that you will find that you give what you don't have. You know what you give? You give what you have. The Bible says in, in our text, down a few verses, that it's according to that a man hath, not that he hath not. So in other words, we take what we have, and here's where faith comes in. We give what we have and say, God, I, I, I don't have enough for, for this and myself, but I'm giving to you a sacrifice. I'm giving to you more than what I feel that is comfortable with. I'm giving to you more. I'm giving you out of what I have, and then we trust God to supply our needs. Again, there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. You have to trust God for what God wants you to give. I'm not asking you to give uh, what you don't have. God's not asking you to give what you don't have. God asked Moses, he said, Moses, what's in your hand? Moses said, a rod. God said, okay, I want you to take that rod and I'm going to use it. God's not looking for what you don't have. God's looking for what you have. Remember the little boy, uh, Jesus, uh, had, they had a multitude. Jesus was teaching the multitude. And there's thousands of people, probably fifteen or 20,000 people, sitting on the hillside that day, listening to God. And God said, okay, boys, <laughs> talking to his disciples, all right, boys, let's give them something to eat. And Philip's like, you know, he's looking, through, he's, he's, he's doing the, oh boy, let's look through the wallet and see what we got. Lord, we don't have enough. And then a little boy comes up. I don't know if he heard the conversation. You know, I, I mean, I, he's probably an eager young boy wanting to watch a miracle. His mom gives him a lunch. He runs out there because I know how boys are because I have one and I are one. And so he, he runs out there eager to see Christ on the hillside. And he wants to see a miracle. He wants to see. So he's sitting in the front row and he hears Jesus say to the disciples, to Philip, you know, let's give them to eat. And Philip, Lord, we don't have enough. Even 200 penny worth is not enough to feed all these people. And the little boy's like, hey, you can have my lunch. Here's my, here's my basket, my five loaves, my two fish. Here's my basket. Here's what I've got to give. And you can, ha you can have that. Somebody else can have it. Boys are a lot of times impulsive. And so he's probably not thinking, well, I'm hungry. I want to eat my own food. He's probably just hearing and, and he goes, oh, you can have this, you know. And Philip comes to Jesus with five loaves and two fish. And God took, Jesus took that five loaves and two fish, blessed it, break it, and gave it to the entire multitude. And probably somewhere 15 to 20,000, maybe more, ate that one boy's lunch. God's not looking for what you don't have. He's looking to take your basket, your five loaves and two fish, to bless it, to break it, and to make it much greater than we could ever imagine. And so my challenge this morning is what's in your basket? Paul said to prove the sincerity of your love. What's in your basket? What's in your hand that you can give to God this morning? We have these faith promise cards. If you haven't filled one out, I'm going to challenge you again to fill it out. Make a commitment to God. This morning, tonight, make a commitment to God. And let's do for missions, let's do for the missionaries much greater than what we could ever imagine by God taking our basket, by God taking what we have and blessing it and breaking it. And there's so much more that God can do with what we have than we can do with it. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love to us. And Lord, we think of this great church here in Macedonia that out of their deep poverty, they gave. They gave far beyond their power. They took what they had and they gave it and you used it in a mighty way. And Lord, help us to be challenged like Paul was challenging this church in Corinth to give greater than we could ever imagine, that we give of what we have, that we give ourselves, that we become willing 
a willing vessel to give our basket, to give what we have, to give our lunch. And Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do in, in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to ask one simple question. Would there be, would there be one or more to, this morning that would say, Pastor, I don't, I don't even know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Not sure that I'm going to heaven. Would you just sl- slip your hand up for me for a moment? I'll, I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm just going to pray for you. But you're not sure that you're going to heaven. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you for a moment? All right, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, would you stand with me? And the piano will begin to play. If God has spoken to your heart in any way in this service this morning, would you come? There's an altar here that you can kneel at and ask God, what, what, what do you want from me, God? Here's my basket. Here's, here's what I have that I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give myself to make myself a willing sacrifice, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, Brother Brian's down here in the front. We'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can know 100% for sure, without a doubt, that you're going to heaven. Would you come down this morning and just take him by the hand and just let him know that you want to be saved? Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Just come on down. We'll take the Bible. Your man will, will have a man show you from the Word of God what the Bible says about how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. If you're a lady, we'll have a lady take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. Don't wait, don't delay. We're not promised another day. Christian, are you doing what you can for the cause of Christ? Are you giving and going and doing everything that you can for for Christ? Maybe you were convicted about the part of obedience in your life. Are you proving your love for Christ by your obedience? Amen. Thank you all for coming this morning. If you're visiting with us, we appreciate you coming and hope that you come back again sometime. Brother Dave, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?